The views expressed in this show are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy, or the U.S. government. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Philosophication with Ginger and the Beard. I'm Michael Autry, and I have red hair. And I'm Jason McGinty, and I have a beard. Um, should we talk about some stuff and things? Yeah. What well, things uh, did you have on your mind? Yeah, so the first thing is uh, it was a, a Facebook meme that was shared by a right wing person that I'm friends with on Facebook. It was this, uh, it's this like really patriotic looking picture. Um, it has like, there's a bald Eagle and an American flag in the background. And there's like a picture of the constitution with the words, we, the people and a picture of Donald Trump. And it says in, in really dramatic lettering, it's like when you attack Donald Trump, you attack, we, the people. And it, and it has like our president at the bottom. Mm. And so I have several problems with this. Before you get into that, may I give them a little bit of credit real yeah. quick? Specifically speaking, they're not exactly wrong. If we use the word attack literally, which I'm sure yeah. they're not, for someone to actually attack the president physically would be an attack on the American people and America as a whole. But yeah, I'm sure that's not what they mean. Yeah. So, well, it, again, we were just talking about this not too long ago, the, the watering down of terms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the word attack, attack means something. <laughs> another one. Like I'm sure this person or the, the, whoever made this meme or whoever shares this meme, I'm sure they don't just mean physically attacking the president, which is, you know, not okay. But, uh, I think, you know, in, in context of knowing this person and knowing the kind of things they post all the time, uh, I think by attack, they probably would mean, you know, disagree with him, which, you know, that's, uh, you know, terms getting watered down. But anyway, um, so, yeah, I have several problems with this. First of all, this idea of we the people it's like how many I, I don't know exactly what the voter turnout was for this election but it, it was I, I'm I assume it was less than a hundred million people you know less than a third of the country voted less than a third of the country usually votes at least I actually looked this up recently and I don't remember why but I don't remember the exact numbers, but I know it's like 275,000 ish million. Sorry, 275 million ish can vote. Like that's how many adults live in America. And it was like less than half voted. Yeah. So low numbers, yeah. low, low voter turnout numbers is the point. And out of those who voted, 50 ish percent voted for Donald Trump. So you're talking about, you know, maybe, what, 80 million people out of 320 million that actually voted for Donald Trump. And out of those, how many voted for him because, you know, they thought Hillary was even worse and they don't actually like him that much? So it, I don't know, but I, I think... The point is, you're saying we the people and referring to this kind of small, I mean, it, it's a large minority, I guess, but a, a pretty small segment of the American population that actually voted for Donald Trump. And it seems odd to me to call that we the people. It's like, you know, he was elected by the system that we have. So technically, yes, I mean, you could say that the American people chose him as a president. I just think it's weird to to say that when you when you disagree with the president, you're disagreeing with the American people as if the American people are one collective entity that have a, a single mind. And I see that I see that phrase used by people on the right in particular and 
it always it always strikes me as a little odd because of that because i don't think it's i don't think you can refer to such a large group of people as this monolithic thing that that you can agree or disagree with so that's that's my first problem do you have any comments on that yeah i mean i think we the people is a monolithic thing like i think i mean the way it's used is meant to mean you know we you know as a whole and represented by our duly elected officials but you know and especially like in the constitution they use we the people all the time right and it doesn't necessarily mean 50 percent plus one of us it means all of us and it doesn't mean all of us agreed about this, but you know, when it says we, the people, you know, ordain and establish this constitution, right. That doesn't mean 50% plus one agreed on it or a hundred percent agreed on it. But it, I'm trying to think of the word for it. It's, it's not a metaphor, but it's not literal either. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, but, I get what but I, I mean, I here, I think, uh, I think we the people makes the most sense in contrast with they the government. You know, when there's if those are the two different things you can be, there's the people and the government. So that's about the only context I could see it in. You know what I mean? But not in like a voting base. You know, it's certainly not even a quarter. Of, of Americans who could vote yeah. voted I mean, for the, this guy that in no way represents the people. So, yeah. And kind of the context that's being used in here is that um, if you, if you don't take the word attack literally, which I don't think you should in this right. context. Um, but if you don't take the word attack literally in this context, it basically, it's basically saying if you, if you speak out against, something Donald Trump has said or done, you're speaking out against we the people. Yeah. And that's just, that's totally off base as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it doesn't make any damn sense for the reasons you talked about that. It's not even half of half of the voting population. Right. So right. that, that in no way means that we're all on board but, uh, you know, if, if like, like an attack on the presidency itself would be an attack on America, but, you know, even if it wasn't necessarily physical, right. Um, if, you know, someone or some foreigner with some adversary or something, some foreign country government was, you know, basically dishonoring the president, not as a person, but like the whole, our system of government or like the, the executive as, as an idea, then that would be insulting to all of us. But an insult to a guy who is in that position is not an insult to all of us. And, right. you know, even if he had a hundred percent of the vote, that would still be like half of the voting public. It wouldn't even be, and the voting public isn't everyone. So, or that would be half of the voting eligible public. So, so yeah, sorry, I'm ranting about it, but yeah, yeah. for I mean, the reasons you enumerated, for the reason you said, it makes no sense because it's not even close to a majority of us. And then on the other hand, maybe you're going to get there. This might be your other problem. Just the idea that a criticism of the president or a, president of, a criticism of something he does is even wrong, that that's something we shouldn't do yeah, that's where another I'm, problem. Yeah, so uh, kind of going off of that, my my other problem with this, which is the bigger problem, I would say, is that somehow it seems to be implying that disagreement with authority is a, is wrong and something we shouldn't do in America. It seems to be advocating for blind following of whoever the, of Donald Trump in particular, it seems to be advocating for blind acceptance of authority, right? Which is 
totally not at all. And, and granted, I, I'm inferring some things here, right? I'm inferring that they mean, I'm inferring that by attack, they mean disagree with, right? Which I think is a reasonable thing to infer from, you know, the context that it's being used in. But if we, if we make that assumption, then it seems to me that's what this is implying. It's like, if you, like you should, you cannot disagree with the, with authority. You can't disagree with the president because you're going against the American people and that's wrong and you shouldn't do that. When that's, you know, our, our whole country is founded on not blindly accepting authority, right? Right, yeah. Say that to our founders. <laughs> like, yeah, if exactly. they bought that philosophy at all, then we'd still be England. Right. So yeah, granted, I'm making a couple assumptions, but I think they're reasonable assumptions. And uh, that's um, that's kind of the flip side of of the left wing authoritarianism that we see so often today. It's like, um, you know, the left and the right both have their both have their versions of authoritarianism, and for the left, it seems to be this whole idea of intersectionality and uh you know whatever that whole thing is and on the right it's it's accept our guy because he's in power right now yeah i think it's just another example of consequentialism like i've talked about before that people don't actually have people aren't actually principled at all in general they Maybe that's too broad of a statement, but many people are not actually principled at all. They just care about getting what they want and keeping their opponents from getting what they want. It sounds like a statement of principle to say you can't criticize the president, but they do it as soon as it's a different president and they don't care about him. Like they yeah. don't actually have a problem with it until it's their guy. So. Yeah. Well, I actually have, um, I have a great point on that specific thing about just it not being okay to criticize the president. And what's funny is this quote has actually come up a bunch of times lately, but it's mostly from lefties who don't normally give a shit. Um, so I find it funny coming from them, but it's still a good quote. And I hate that they've been stealing it, but I actually brought it up in, I'm pretty sure my first, my, my first episode, my second episode, the one that was actually about free speech. Um, it was a, a quote I put in that episode and now everyone's saying it because pretty much I think memes like the one you're talking about is like driving this counter movement on the left to all of a sudden talk about how patriotic it is to, to criticize the president, right? Yeah. But you find the quote. Yeah. yeah I mean, on a side note, the memes are just a terrible form of political discourse so i'm certain i brought this up and i quoted him when talking about the sedition act that uh woodrow wilson had passed when he was president it was during world war one um the sedition act that basically people were jailed for speaking out against the military or the government and uh you know a lot of them were eventually pardoned but i talked about this so teddy roosevelt said quote to announce that there must be no criticism of the president or that we are to stand by the president, right or wrong, is not only unpatriotic and servile, but is morally treasonable to the American public. And then he goes on to say that nobody deserves critic like to, to be more scrutinized than he does. Not not Wilson specifically, he was talking about Wilson at the time, but the president as the office of the president. Right. So and that's certainly true. You know, to 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 suggest that we that he cannot be criticized, and this is any president. I'm not talking about Trump. That they can't be criticized. We have to stand by them, right or wrong. Like he says, is treasonable to the American public because there's nothing less American than than that than that idea that we have to stand by the government no matter how bad they are. That's like the most un-American yeah. thing you could ever say. So so it's an odd thing to hear coming from the right. Yeah. You know, it's like you hear this 
from the same people who who will say, you know, we need guns to protect ourselves against the government, which, yeah. you know, it's yeah. like, so you're going to say that, that the purpose of the second amendment is to protect against government tyranny. And at the same time, criticizing the president is something you shouldn't do. Right. Yeah. We shouldn't use our words. We should use our guns. <laughs> like, yeah. We got to just right. jump straight to guns if we got have a problem. Right. So, yeah, that, yeah, that doesn't I mean, make any sense. What it comes down to is is having opinions based on consequences and not on principles. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, because the principle is, if you, if you were truly principled, then it would be you can talk about him, and you can have guns, and you know the Constitution is the Constitution. The principles that founded our 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 country were the very principles of fighting against a tyrannical government, not just doing whatever they say and agreeing with everything they tell you. Like yeah. there's nothing less American than just standing idly by as your government screws you over. And I'm not saying that's what's happening, but if people feel that way, they should be allowed to express that. Yeah. Yeah. It's one thing to argue yeah. with them. That's the thing. Like if you're being honest and fair about it, then you just engage people who say stuff. If you think they're wrong about what they say about the president, then you engage them and you argue with them and you prove them wrong. But to just, it's just like the left is doing. You're just trying to shut down the conversation. You're trying to say the conversation itself is off limits. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing about that phrase, we the people. It's like, I think, I think it's used in that way often. It's uh, people will say, we, the people believe such and such, or the American people believe such and such. And therefore that's the end of the conversation, right? Like there's no further discussion to be had because the American people have spoken and that's not how it works or that's not how it should work. Right. Yeah. And because the left does the same thing about, you know, Hillary winning the, the popular vote, right? They're like, so the majority voted for Hillary. And I'm like, well, no, they didn't because half of us didn't vote. So imagine a world where not voting was the same as voting for neither, right? Or nobody, right? Then we would have no president at all. That'd be a fun game to play. <laughs> if every, every person who didn't vote was a vote for a third option, which was no president whatsoever, right? So we'd have just no president, but that's what the real majority of the country wants is what if we had neither. What if, neither. The, what if the third option was redo? <laughs> yeah. Third option was pick two new candidates and redo. Yeah. Yeah. So if that's, again, it's like people who pretend to care about democracy, majoritarianism, it's not a majority. You're wrong when you say, Oh, she won by 3 million votes. That's still a plurality. That is not democracy. That is not Okay, that's not majoritarianism. That is still a minority picking the president. Right. Because the majority seems to prefer neither every time. Yeah. So. Yeah. But that just goes to show we're not a majoritarian country. We are sometimes, right? Some things, that's how it goes. And sometimes we're not. But it's not some, that's not the foundation, right? There's some, we protect the minority, in certain ways, we protect the little guy, but if it was just a straight up democracy, then things would be different. But right. Anyway. Well, that was that was interesting, and you know, maybe I, I think we tend to talk about you know talk shit about the left most of the time. So maybe you know maybe we'll get some left wing fans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> a couple of white guys. <laughs> Yeah. That's impossible. <laughs> yeah, we're not diverse at all. Yeah, we are. No. You have you have red hair and I have brown hair. <laughs> You're supposed to say I have red hair and you have a beard. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole premise. We're trying to yeah. display our diversity for everybody so they know that we are have very different thought thought processes. But Yeah. I mean, the way the way gingers and people with beards see the world is, you know, radically different. You know? Yeah. 
you yeah. don't you have no idea what it's like to to live in a world with a beard yeah you you don't have uh, you, you have no idea what my day to day experience is like yeah yeah tell me have you ever been outside and like every moment that you're out there there's this giant giant force that's trying to kill you <laughs> That's what it's like to be a ginger, right? <laughs> and that giant force is the sun. <laughs> Nobody else knows tyranny like a ginger does. We need to break free from the tyranny of the sun. But that's impossible because the whole planet would die without it. Talk about a dilemma, all right? Yeah, the whole system is just built around non-gingers. Yeah, yeah. That's real tyranny right there. And there's no escape. And we have no advocates. Nobody's advocating for us. Where's the where's the umbrella lobby? You know, <laughs> there should be free lo free umbrellas that the government pays for. Since we're all getting handouts, right? There's no Umbre damn umbrellas. We're going extinct. We're like one percent of the population. It's no joke. Some of us have white eyebrows, so we just look ridiculous, right? <laughs> you got to go through life like that. That's real tyranny, right? That's real oppression. That's worse than a patriarchy. It's like the actual, God, the actual center of our solar system is out to get us. It's trying to kill us all the time. So anyway, so I think we really win the oppression Olympics because we're the tiniest minority and literally every day we're being attacked. Unless you live sun, north of the Arctic Circle. The sun commits violence against you every day. Yeah. Hate crime. Yep. Yep. The sun is a hate criminal. Yeah. That's, a, that's our name for this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, moving on. Yeah. So I, heard, I, first, I first heard about it on, on Ben Shapiro's show. But, you know, it's... You know, I, I looked into it. Turns out it's real. And uh, that, like, O Magazine featured a column about Amelia Bono, who it says she's a founder of the founder of the quote, shout your abortion movement. Oh, yeah. I don't know what it means to found like a hashtag, but I don't know if that's actually like a thing, like an organization, but apparently she founded it, whatever the hell that is. And uh, so basically, long story short, it's this movement for women who have had abortions to basically brag about it and to talk about how proud they are of having done it. And, uh, you know, abortion, is it's, a, it's not a topic I've covered yet in my own show. And because it's it's going to take a lot of time and I think it's such a it's such an important topic and it's such a but there's so much nuance I think um there's so much to think about and uh you know you've heard uh, Dave Rubin calls himself a uh, begrudgingly like pro choice. choice yeah is that what he calls it begrudgingly yeah yeah so I like to think of myself as begrudgingly pro life and I definitely haven't always been here. So my own, in my own experience, I, I, I've gone from totally pro-choice to totally pro-life. And now I'm kind of like so many other things. And it sounds like a cop-out, but I mean, I do make a choice. And that is, it, I am pro-life. But I'll say begrudgingly so. And I say that because I... I sympathize with the liberty argument. And that's where I started. Like when I said I started pro-choice, I think, so again, it's, it's, almost like, it's almost like the Hiroshima bombing that we talked about already. Yeah. If, if you think this is simple, then you're not thinking about it enough. And I think that's on either side. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, so, so obviously, now I can't begin to, enumerate all the reasons one might justify the pro-choice 
perspective. There's a billion reasons that people do it. Uh, some of them are very well thought out. Some of them are more just like, well, I want to be able to have one. So that's why, or, well, I want my girlfriend to be able to have one or some girl I sleep with. And that's why, but to me, what made, what I sympathize with and where I kind of started is the Liberty argument just on its face. It seems to make sense that the government just shouldn't have anything to do with this. It's, it's just, you should be free to do whatever you want, right? That's kind of the default. That's where I start from generally when it comes to anything is let's be as free as we can, as we can be with very few exceptions. Right? So I'm like sympathetic to the Liberty argument, you know, and they call it pro choice for a reason. That's, that's smart camp. That's, uh, that's smart. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's smart branding and advertising to call it pro choice because who isn't pro choice, like not pro abortion, but the idea yeah. of choice, everyone is on board with that. I would have asked, uh, it, that, that's a, that seems like a good branding decision because who is pro abortion? Like who wants, who wants to get an abortion? Like, you know, two years ago, I would have said that's never ideal. Like if you could just choose to not get pregnant instead, obviously that would be the better route. But, uh, you know, today, uh, that's kind of changed a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my, that's thing. Yeah. So, so that's my point is I've always been sympathetic to that argument and I can't see a way around it. I can't just dismiss it. Right. But then what changed me was when I just really sat and thought about it. Right. So this is one of those things, just like the Hiroshima bombing, I think you're not doing yourselves any, you're, you're selling yourself short if you don't think about both sides. And it's not just seeing what your enemy thinks because we all feel the same way. We all want choice in our life. We all want to be able to make our own decisions. We all generally care about the sanctity of human life. That's, that's a common feature on both sides of this. So you don't even have to like imagine you are someone else. Just imagine, you don't have to imagine anything. Just appeal to this idea, right? And, and what the reason I, I swung to the other side and became just pro-life was just the fact that I, I can't get over the fact that no matter how you slice it, no matter what your reason is, no matter how good the reason or how bad the reason, you, you are killing somebody. Somebody is dead after you do it, right? So whatever justification you can come up with, it's, to me, it's just like so many other moral decisions. It's a, it's a balancing act, right? You have the liberty argument and you have the life argument. And I've always been sympathetic to the liberty one, but to me, it just, it just the balance swung the other way when I really thought about it. And, it. and it occurred to me that, you know, no matter how you try and describe it, you're killing somebody. Right. right. So I think about this uh, and I've, I've kind of put these pieces together since we talked about the Hiroshima bombing and because of something that we kind of mentioned in that conversation. Um, but I listened to the same Shapiro episode you did. And I was thinking about this after I listened to that. And uh, it's like, it's the same thing we were talking about the same moral, uh, the same kind of, question that we were talking about with the Hiroshima bombing, where it's not a question of, is this a good or a bad thing? Like, it's a bad thing. Right. Acknowledge the downside of your own position. It's a bad thing. Like, if you could choose to either have an abortion or not get pregnant, obviously not getting pregnant is way better. Like, having an abortion is a bad thing. But the question is, is it justified? It's not a question of, is this good or bad? It's a question of, is it justified? Right. It's justified. Same as, you know, same as we were talking about with the Hiroshima bombing. And, uh, I mean, that's, that seems to me like the reasonable perspective. Like, we can talk about the question of whether it's justified. But now we have people who won't even acknowledge that it's bad. Yeah, and, and that's the new thing to me. That's 
I'm, I'm, it seems like it actually is new. I'm, I'm sure these women have been out there doing like for a while, but it's like a growing movement. It seems it's big enough that Oprah's kind of endorsing it and getting behind it. But to finish what I was saying before, like I went totally pro-life and then I've kind of, as I've thought more about it, I've, I've swung back to the middle, but I am begrudgingly pro-life. I say begrudgingly because I understand the liberty argument. I don't like the government doing that. I wish we would just decide as a society what the right answer is and and all that, but I just don't think we're ever going to get there. And so I'm begrudgingly pro-life. If people were just more decent and, you know, whatever. Uh, so anyway. So since I'm, I'm at that point now, so I can, so for a while now, I've been able to understand the, the liberty argument. I've been able to, when we're talking about not the morality of it, but justification for it, I get it. I don't agree, but I get it. Everything they say is essentially true. It's just, they need to also consider the other side of it. And when I consider that side of it, it weighs more, you know what I mean? And yeah. So you don't have to agree with me on that. And we can talk about that. And that's a great conversation to have a great good faith conversation to have. But what I can't understand is exactly what you're talking about. The, the, to shout your abortion, to be proud of it. And like, it was a good thing. And there are literally women who oh, I forget some famous lady was like, said like she wished she had had an abortion. She never had. And she was like wishing that she had. And you know, like, so like in this Oprah, whatever it is, like, so this hashtag shout your abortion is like this thing on trending on Twitter. And it's so what I can't understand and what I can't really even fathom is to not just justify it, but to praise it as some moral good, as if it's a good thing. How, like, Frankly, it's disgusting to me. And I know that's that's not great. And I would love it if, I mean, if anyone listening who feels that way would please try and justify it, like in the comments or whatever. I would love to hear from one of these women. And I, I, I know plenty of people who are pro-choice, right? And that's a that's an interesting conversation in itself. But what I've, as far as I know, I've never spoken with someone who has been overtly just pro abortion to the point that they want to celebrate it and 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 brag about it right so to me that's like i've i've kind of been drawing this parallel between this conversation and the and the bombing conversation to me right. wishing you'd had an abortion like or the idea that someone could get pregnant on purpose just so they could get an abortion. That's like the same as saying the same as like, if Japan offered to surrender, they're like, here, we surrender. And Truman was like, let's just drop the bomb for fun. You know? Yeah. Like that's, that's the, that's kind of what that sounds like to me. It's like, yeah. let's just do this thing just because we can. And that's horrible. Yeah. And then to brag about it, right? Yeah, It's one thing to make the decision and then to gloat about it, to brag about it, to shout about it. it. Yeah. And so I do think that's horrible, but in the interest of being a little bit charitable, um, let's acknowledge the fact that I, I, there is a reason for this. Uh, there is a reason for, I, I think for people shouting that stuff and I think it's backlash to what the other extreme does. You know, you'll have people on the other side, on the pro-life side who have no interest in having this nuanced conversation. Um, they'll say that it's, it's always wrong and you're a horrible person. If you've ever done it, no matter what your justification was, like there's no possible justification, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. And I think it's a backlash to that. And both of them are wrong. Um, but I, to, to some degree, I can understand a little bit where that backlash is coming from. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and people, I, God, man, like the more we talk about different stuff, the more I realize it's all the same. Yeah. You have people are completely unwilling to accept that there's any negative side to what their, to what their viewpoint is to them. It's not a balancing act. It's not a teeter totter. That's that leans one way over the other. It's just a complete home run, the right thing to do. And, you know, I guess I kind of understand that a little bit with a pro-life argument. I mean, it is a pretty solid thing to say that, you know, you're killing somebody that's wrong. End of story. And, but there, there just has to be more nuance because that's, that's a fine, you know, strong principled stance to take, but you're not going to win any hearts and minds that way. You know what I mean? You're going to just demonize everybody. If you want to change minds, you got to, you got to meet them in the middle. You got to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And it's not because they're evil and awful. Right. And that's the thing. Like if a woman gets an abortion, I'm not saying she needs to hate herself or just not be able to sleep and be depressed and, and live the rest of her life, you know, in pain. I'm not saying that's the only appropriate response, but you know, it should be a difficult decision. It should be just like dropping the damn bomb in Hiroshima. No matter what the justification, can you at least just pause for five seconds and just realize no matter how righteous this decision is, there is a, a little negative and yeah. that's a dead person right someone is dead now right like now you may still feel justified and that's and we and that's a great conversation to have but i i don't know i hate to say it but like the only the the word that comes to mind is disgusting i think it's absolutely disgusting to celebrate it to be proud of it to you know Again, you don't have to beat yourself or anything, but it should be a difficult decision. Yeah. Even if you make it quickly, you should contemplate the consequences and know what you're doing. And if you still go for it, you can stand by that. And you can, you can have a principled stance and stand behind it. But, man, I cannot understand being proud of it. Yeah. It was actually a book, by the way. Like, I guess this lady who started this movement, that's where this movement is going, is she wrote a book called Shout Your Abortion. Mm -hmm. um, oh, never mind. Yeah, it was a different chick. So it's Miss Jessa Jordan, a Philadelphia-based model, writer, and event curator she wrote about her abortion in hustler okay that's cool <laughs> um but yeah there's all these memes like looking back on it i know that i made the right choice for my one wild life okay fair enough shot your abortion there's a book fucking let's see my abortion was gentle, irreverent, and empowering. There's like bumper stickers, like shameless abortion and shout your abortion. So anyway, what's even more, I, I guess what's especially disturbing is now it's an O magazine. So basically Oprah Winfrey herself is endorsing this now. So this was some fringe thing of a, of a couple of crazy asshole ladies who just you know, don't care at all about the consequences of what they're doing. And then, but now it's Oprah Winfrey is endorsing it. So, I mean, do I think that's going to change a lot of minds, but uh, do I think it's going to change a lot of minds? No, but I think a lot of women who maybe on some level are proud of it, but feel there's a stigma about bragging about it will now brag about it. They think the stigma has gone. So, yeah. you know, the stigma belongs there. There's a reason for it. I think shame, this is just a general thing that's going totally wrong with our society is uh, there's no shame anymore. People, yeah. 
that's a, that's actually an interesting topic when we start getting into the Iliad because there's shame all over the place in that in yeah. that story but uh yeah we can talk a lot about shame and honor and that kind of thing saw this new new york times article this week i think it was uh it was like a couple days ago um i think i'm just gonna read the the article because it's not that long um so kelly marie tran the actress who played the worst character in the worst star wars movie debatably there were a lot of horrible characters in that movie no, she was the worst. Um, yeah. You you could make an argument for Admiral Gender Studies, maybe. <laughs> but uh, Maybe, but at least the plot that was going on is a plot you kind of cared about. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, I don't know. Like, I don't know if she's a bad actor. She might be a, she might be a fine actor. I don't know. She's just got a horrible character to play for this movie. Right. Um not saying she's a bad person or anything, but uh, I do think she's wrong about some some stuff, as we'll see in this article. So the backstory on this is Kelly Marie Tran was, quote unquote, bullied off of Instagram um, because of online harassment. You know, people uh, talking about, you know, saying racist slurs to her. She's Vietnamese. Um saying racist slurs to her and, and call her names and that kind of thing, which first off with the online harassment thing, you remember that South Park episode, the, uh, the world of Warcraft one where the, the guys show up to Randy's house and they're like, sir, your son's party is already in battle. If we don't get the sword of a thousand truths to him right now, they could die. And Randy's like, no, oh my God. I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> That's my reaction to whenever I hear about online harassment. It's like people were mean on the internet. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. That's my reaction. Yeah. Like, what else is new? You know, welcome to the internet. Yeah. Like, people say horrible things on the internet. It's happened since the internet existed. It's happened since George Washington's day. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so there was that whole thing. Uh, Kelly Marie Tran got, got a whole bunch of online harassment, like every other famous person, I'm sure. Um, and anyway, so she, she wrote this piece in the New York Times this week. Uh, the headline is, Kelly Marie Tran, I won't be marginalized by online harassment. So I'm going to read this thing. It'll take me like a couple minutes, probably. So here we go. It wasn't their words, it's that I started to believe them. Their words seemed to confirm what growing up as a woman and a person of color already taught me, that I belonged in margins and spaces, valid only as a minor character in their lives and stories. And those words awakened something deep inside me, a feeling I thought I had grown out of, the same feeling I had when at nine I stopped speaking Vietnamese altogether because I was tired of hearing other kids mock me. Or at 17, when at dinner with my white boyfriend and his family, I ordered a meal in perfect English to, to the surprise of the waitress who exclaimed, wow, it's so cute that you have an exchange student. Their words reinforced a narrative I, have, I had heard my whole life, that I was other, that I didn't belong, that I wasn't good enough simply because I wasn't like them. And that feeling I realize now was and is a shame, a shame for the things that made me different, a shame for the culture from which I came from. And to me, the most disappointing thing was that I felt it at all. Because the same society that taught some people they were heroes, saviors, inheritors of the manifest destiny ideal, taught me I existed only in the background of their stories, doing their nails, diagnosing their illnesses, supporting their love interests, and perhaps the most damaging, waiting for them to rescue me. And for a long time, I believed them. I believed those words, those stories, carefully crafted by a society that was built to uphold the power of one type of person, one sex, one skin tone, one existence. It reinforced within me rules that were written before I was born, rules that made my parents deem it necessary to abandon their real names and adopt American ones, Tony and Kay, so it was easier for others to pronounce, a, liter a literal erasure of culture that still has me aching to the core. And as much as I hate to admit it, I started blaming myself. I thought, oh, maybe if I was thinner, or maybe if I grow out my hair, and worst of all, maybe if I wasn't Asian. 
For months, I went down a spiral of self-hate into the darkest recesses of my mind, places where I tore myself apart, where I put their words above my own self-worth. And it was then that I realized I had been lied to. I had been brainwashed into believing that my existence was limited to the boundaries of another person's approval. I had been tricked into thinking that my body was not my own, that I was beautiful only if someone else believed it, regardless of my own opinion. I had been told and retold this by everyone, by the media, by Hollywood, by companies that profited from my insecurities, manipulating me so that I would buy their clothes, their makeup, their shoes, in order to fill a void that was perpetuated by them in the first place. Yes, I have been lied to. We all have. And it was in this realization that I felt a different shame, not a shame for who I was, but a shame for the world I grew up in and a shame for how that world treats anyone who is different. I am not the first person to have grown up in this way. This is what it is to grow up as a person of color in a white dominated world. This is what it is to be a woman in a society that has taught its daughters that we are worthy of love only if we are deemed attractive by its sons. This is the world I grew up in, but not the world I want to leave behind. I want to live in a world where children of color don't spend their entire adolescence wishing to be white. I want to live in a world where women are not subjected to scrutiny for their appearance or their actions or their general existence. I want to live in a world where people of all races, religions, socioeconomic classes, sexual orientation, orientations, gender identities and abilities are seen as what they have always been, human beings. This is the world I want to live in. And this is the world that I will continue to work toward. These are the thoughts that run through my head every time I pick up a script or a screenplay or a book. I know the opportunity given to me is rare. I know that I now belong to a small group of privileged people who gets to tell stories for a living. Stories that are heard and seen and digested by a world that for so long has tasted only one thing. I know how important that is, and I'm not giving up. You might know me as Kelly. I am the first woman of color to, a, to have a leading role in a Star Wars movie. I am the first Asian woman to appear on the cover of Vanity Fair. My real name is Lowen, and I'm just getting started. So, initial reactions. Well, I think if your accomplishments always start with, well, it starts with first and then ends with like eight adjectives before it says what you actually did then you didn't really do shit. Um, there's been women in Star Wars. There's been non-white people in Star Wars. And she's not a lead. She was a stupid character that nobody cared about. So, yeah, sure. Um, God, what a specific thing to brag about. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, well, that was really hard to hear. What? Yeah. What stands out the most to me is, is just how sorry she feels for herself and just how sorry she wants me to feel for her and how pretty much every human being that grew up got teased, made fun of, bullied. It's not like a, it's not a non-white thing. Like maybe her getting teased was very was specific to her, but everybody gets teased growing up. Kids are assholes. Like the, the idea that there's a grand conspiracy that the white males have, or we're all like part of this gang and we all come up with these rules for society together and we're all in on it and we're just trying to keep everybody down. Now, my God, like, sure, the cosmetic industry, God, I'm all over the place, but uh, there's so much there. Like, yeah, the cosmetic industry tries to make women feel bad about themselves, but that's not their fault. It's your stupid fault for falling for it. Just stop it. And then what the hell are they talking about? That women are taught they have to be attractive to get men? Uh, of course. Do men not think the same thing? How am I supposed to get women if I'm not attractive? Like, we worry about being attractive, too. Like, there's not a big industry for it because we just kind of live with it. We live with what we got. And God dang. Like, so she wants a world where women don't have to feel like they need to be pretty to get a mate. But that is the most natural thing in the world. That's like a freaking, that's like a peacock sticking out his feathers. Like, look at me. You know, you have to attract your mate, right? That's like the most yeah. natural thing in the world. And the fact that they fall for it is their own damn fault. Not... To be a woman doesn't mean you have to fall for that crap. They're targeting you because they're trying to make money. It's not because they're trying to oppress you. 
my God. Uh, see, I wish we'd taken it bit by bit. There's so much wrong with that. But yeah. So the, the thing for me, uh, the first thing that sticks out to me is that this whole talking about being bullied as a kid because of her race or her gender or whatever, the, the implication here is that if I were a white man, none of this would have happened to me. Like I wouldn't have been bullied. Like maybe you did get teased on account of your race. Maybe you did get teased on account of your gender, but let's separate the reasons for the teasing and the fact that you were teased. Like everyone gets teased. Not everyone gets teased for the same reasons. Like, that your reason just so happened to be your race and your gender, maybe. But does that make your teasing worse than anybody else's or different than anybody else's? No, it, it, it's the same teasing that every other kid goes through. And, you know, maybe not all to the same degree. I'm sure some kids get teased worse than others, but everyone gets teased. Everyone goes through hard times as a kid and your particular reasons for getting teased are not don't make you special right yeah and it's always almost always things that are outside of your control that you're being teased for so the fact is you have a little kid being teased for something outside of their control why does it why is it worse if it's this if it's their skin color Kids are assholes and they'll make fun of you for whatever. So if you smell because you're poor and you don't, and you're, you, your parents can't afford to do laundry, you're going to get teased at school. It doesn't matter if you're white or not. If you're a woman or a man, you're going to get, sorry, if you're a boy or a girl, you're going to get teased. If you have red hair, you're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get teased as a kid. Okay. Like you could be poor. You could be, you know, you could have a lisp. You could have, you know, a speech impediment. You could, you could wet the bed. There's a million things that are outside of your control that other kids will make fun of you for. It's not. It doesn't make you special because someone made fun of you. And half the crap she was talking about wasn't getting made fun of. It was like subtle little, little comments that people made. Micro. Right? Microaggressions is almost everything she described was a microaggression, like being impressed that she that she spoke perfect English. Like, okay, like they weren't actually being mean to you, right? Was it kind of ignorant? Sure, you know, whatever. Like, there's a million reasons to get made fun of, and they're all wrong. It's all bad, but it's almost always little kids, and little kids are assholes. So. Yeah, I don't get this idea that there's something special and something worse about being made fun of or being teased or picked on or whatever. If you're being hurt, you know, emotionally or whatever, due to something outside of your control, why is it, why is it worse if it's because you're a girl or because you're Asian? You know, why is that worse than because you're poor or because you smell bad because, you know, your parents don't do your laundry or something or because your parents are on meth and you get made fun of for that. Like there's a kids are cruel and they're awful. So, yeah. So the next thing that sticks out to me about this is when she talks about her parents and uh, how they, they abandoned their real names and started going by American names to make their names easier to pronounce. Um, and she calls this a literal erasure of culture. So when did personal choices become an erasure of culture? That's my question. It's like, so your parents had Vietnamese names that were hard for Americans to pronounce. And so they made the personal choice to start going by American names to accommodate the people around them. That was their choice. They did that. Yeah, they, they didn't they didn't have to do that. No one right, made them do that. do that. They could have, you know, asked people to call them by, you know, told people how to pronounce their Vietnamese names and asked them to call them that. They could have done that. I'm sure what they did was they weighed the pros and cons of do I want to have to go out of my way to 
explain the pronunciation of my name to everybody I tell my name to, or do I want to go by an easier name? And they decided to go with, they decided that there were more pros to taking American names, which fine, that's their choice. If yeah. they had decided their Vietnamese names, that's their choice too. Great. Yeah. It's just pragmatic. It's, it's their choice. They, they chose to do that. No one forced them. No one erased their culture. That is not this whole God erasure of culture. That's such a, that's such a ridiculous phrase. Like, do you think, do you think that they just stopped all of the family traditions that they had? Do you think that, that their whole culture just went out the window because they changed their names? Right. And even if they did, that, that would be their own damn fault. No one made them do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. See, what I would love to see, like, what I would love to hear when I, when people, when people bitch about stuff like this, what I'd love to hear is what, what is a realistic alternative? What do you, what do you expect? What do you want from the rest of the world? The fact is, your parents moved to America. America, like it or not, is a certain way. We mostly speak English here. We mostly have European names. Like, as, as minority cultures grow and grow and grow and become more integrated into the society, whether it's the Italians or, or the Irish or whoever, like, their names become more mainstream. We understand it more. Like... I can't just show up to China and expect them all to know how to pronounce my name. Like that's, that's not fair. And why do I get to feel self-righteous and wronged because they have a culture. My culture's different. I show it'd be different if I show up and they literally throw me in the freaking gulags or they literally make laws that keep me from doing what I want to do or expressing my culture. But if I choose to assimilate and to be like them, which I think is probably a smart decision if I want to be successful in their culture. I can't just show up and demand that they all adopt my culture. That right. just doesn't make any, it's not fair. It doesn't make any sense. That's not practical. It's completely yeah. a fantasy world. So what the hell is the alternative? Now, I, I feel bad if she got literally got made fun of for being Asian or if there were mo like moments in her life where she was ashamed of being Asian. That is sad. All right. But there's no law that kept her from expressing her culture. There is nothing on the books that keeps Asian people down. In fact, Asian people are like the most successful group in this country. They make more money on average than white people. Like white people are number three now, right? It's like they are not oppressed. Now, have they been? Sure. And that's totally different. If you showed up and you were Japanese during World War II, you had a pretty crappy time of it, right? And I'm not saying anything shy of that doesn't... Our culture's come a long way. I'm sure even from the time she was a kid till now, things are better. But this idea that you show up and everybody has to just... And the whole world revolves around you and they have to shift their culture to be like yours. Just, it's, it, it's completely impractical. It doesn't make any damn sense. And yeah. uh, it's just... What the hell do you expect? Yeah, I mean, I think the answer, if you ask that question, what's the alternative? Um, I think the answer of the intersectional types would be, you know, we need our culture needs to change. Yeah, and we just that's... need to accommodate these people. That's what their answer would be. And I think that's a that's just a. It's impractical. Right. It's yeah. And even if it were doable, it would certainly take time. Right. Like you can't just do it overnight. Like even with all hate removed, it's just different. Even if you don't say there's anything wrong with being different, it still is different. So people need to adjust. I don't know how to pronounce Vietnamese names. Now, maybe I could take time out of my damn day and go study their language and learn the way to pronounce, and, and, and first of all, they're taking their own language, putting it in English letters and trying to make, you know, Vietnamese names with English letters. So, like, 
we're supposed to go out of our way to try and learn that. Like the only way you can really get good at that without going out of your way is if you just happen to grow up around Vietnamese people and you learn a few names and you're like, you saw how it was spelled. And then, I mean, how do you know how anyone's name is pronounced? Because you've right. met so, someone with that name before. <laughs> so here's, here's what this come this kind of, so let's say that let's, let's switch it for a second. Let's say that you moved to Vietnam and you know, wanted to live in Vietnam and you know, Vietnamese people don't know how to pronounce your name because it's written in English and you know, you have to explain how to pronounce your name to everyone and they have a hard time with it. So if you, so you weigh this decision, you're like, should I take a Vietnamese name and go by that to make life easier for everybody else around me? Like, you weigh that decision and let's say you decide, no, I want to stick with my English name because I don't want to make the effort of, uh, of learning how to pronounce a Vietnamese name and learning, you know, how to use that for myself. Right. I don't want to make the effort to do that, which is fine. Like that's your decision again. But what you're asking people to do, like, you have to, if you're going to make that decision, you have to either be prepared to explain your name to the people around you. And if you're not prepared to do that, what you're doing is asking everyone around you to do the exact thing that you refuse to do, which is yeah. learn how to pronounce a name in a different language. You're making demands of, of, of other people around you that you're not willing to do yourself. Yeah, and you're making that demand of infinitely many people, like right. of, of everyone. Society needs to change, not me. So, I mean, what the hell's easier and more practical? That society, like, changes everything about itself to accommodate you or that you change to accommodate society? But yeah, I see the hypocr the hypocrisy you're talking yeah. about. And if you don't want to if you don't want to change, maybe you don't want to change to accommodate society, and that's fine. But if you don't want to change to accommodate society, and you, you expecting society to change to accommodate you is just impractical, then you're going to have to be prepared. Like that's just the choice you have to make. If you don't want to change to accommodate society, that's fine. But you're going to have to probably be prepared to to put in a little more effort for yourself than you otherwise would. Yeah. 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 Well, I already hated her. Well, I already hated that character and now I hate the actress. She's a fucking, she's a jackass. Yeah. Poor, poor baby. I feel really bad for her. It must've been <laughs> awful growing up a woman of color. Worked out well for her. Yeah, and you know what? The last thing that sticks out to me about this article is that she shows a little bit of a, a shred of self-awareness right at the end. She's like, I know that I now belong to a small group of privileged people who get to tell stories for a living. Yeah. She's basically acknowledging the fact that she's a rich actress in Hollywood. Yeah. And like, but the whole rest of this article is all poor me and I'm so oppressed. And then at the end, there's this little bit of an admission, like, oh, I'm, I'm totally privileged. I have all this privilege because of my life situation. And yet the whole rest of the article is about how oppressed I am. Yep. Yeah. And I just want to make the point that America is probably the best place in the world to be a Vietnamese woman. Certainly beats the hell out of being a Vietnamese woman in Vietnam. I'm sure that would suck ass because you live in Vietnam which sucks. So God. Yeah. Well, that's about all I got to say about that. Yeah. Like there's so much to talk about when people are just fucking victims and they feel sorry for themselves. You know, I just think it's a little ridiculous to ask me to feel sorry for you when you are a millionaire actress like she admitted, a privileged person who gets to tell stories for a living. 
you're just never going to convince me that I should feel sorry for you. Yeah. Like, no, <laughs> you feel sorry for people that are less fortunate than you. And you're not just, you're not less fortunate because you're an Asian woman. That's clearly not how that turned out. Yeah. Even statistically, that's that is, not true. Except that that is how it is for yeah. that person. Yeah. It's not even statistically true. So not only is she individually, you know, doing quite fine and I do not feel sorry for her, but then even statistically, like we said before, like Asian people are doing very well in America economically, right? They are, they are, they have the highest rates of acceptance into the best schools. They're doing very well, right? Yeah. And that's not because of special treatment. That's just because they're doing well. And, and, and it's all anecdotal. That's like the problem with it. Yeah. So I'll, this, well, this is something I'll say. I think this is the greatest point is that every, it's, it's completely anecdotal. You could, find a, you, could find a, you could find a million white people that could write a very similar article about how shitty it was growing up them, you know, and some of them might even be able to blame their whiteness for what they were getting teased about. If you're yeah. a white, if you're a little white kid growing up in a minority neighborhood, a neighborhood that's full of Asian people or black people or Hispanic people, and you're like the only white kid, or there's just a few white kids, you're going to get teased for it. Just like the freaking Asian kid in an all white, in an all white neighborhood or whatever. Except I think the opposite is even true. White kid, white people are, white children, white people now are so sensitive to not being racist because we're all called racist for everything we do that they just go out of their way to try and not say anything. And so, in fact, I feel like it would be harder to be a white kid in an, a predominantly minority school than it would be to my, than it would be to be a minority in a predominantly white school. Now, since we're throwing out anecdotes, what's her name again? Kelly Marie Tran. Kelly Marie Tran. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So since we're throwing out anecdotes, Kelly Marie Tran, I went to a high school in Tennessee with, I don't know what the percentage was, but if I recall, I, I think there were five maybe black people in my graduating class. One black man. So of all those black people, four were women, one was a man. Guess who the prom king was? <laughs> the one black guy in the whole school. I'm not saying it's because he was black, but I don't feel bad for that guy. He grew up in the South in a com almost completely white school. And he was he's a good guy. People liked him. Did anyone ever say something racist to him? Probably. I'm sure that happened. But it didn't affect his social life too much. We all liked him pretty well. <laughs> It wasn't because he was black. It wasn't in spite of him being black. It just, so I don't think you get the same thing at an all black school and you have this one white kid. Has that ever happened in the history of school? whatever? So since we're telling anecdotes, whatever. But I think for every, you know, a million white people could write a similar fucking story about growing up and getting teased, being, being, being made to believe that they were less, that they were inferior, that they were an, an other, you know, Everybody has stories like that. The fa it's completely anecdotal. She has no evidence to back this up. She's she because of a few comments that were made to her growing up. She then concludes that there is this conspiracy, this grand conspiracy. This there's a yeah. normal, the white she male. That, she says that explicitly too. Um, she says, uh, "I believe those words, those stories." Carefully crafted by a society that was built to uphold the power of one type of person. So yeah, that's she's she's explicitly talking about a conspiracy there, right? By society. Yes, society did its damnedest to make her feel bad that day. That's what it was. But there's no evidence for that. There's no systemic problem here except her stupid anecdotes. And everyone has anecdotes about getting treated badly and feeling bad. And again, men feel worthless. Men feel ugly. Men feel fat and squishy and weak and like soft jawed and, and hairless on their face. You know, like whatever it is, men have a million reasons to be ashamed of the way they look. Stupid hairless faced people. Right. So it's not unique, right? If they're worse about it, I don't know. It's your own damn fault as an individual. 
You don't have to buy it. You don't have to fall for it. That's your own stupid fault. Don't blame society. Even if it is society's fault, so what? What are you going to do about it? Should the whole industry change or can you just grow the fuck up? You know? So anyway, if there is a very big divide in what it's like growing up, it's, it's along class lines, not racial lines. Growing up poor is a very different experience yeah. than growing up not poor. And it doesn't matter if you're white or black or Hispanic, you have the same problems from being poor or yeah. growing up in a broken home. You could be in a middle class, even upper class home where your parents are divorced or you only have one parent. And there's problems that come about no matter what, whether you're white or black or Hispanic or Asian or whatever, you, you see the same issues that come about. Yeah. I was talking to somebody about that not too long ago. It was, must have been a few months ago, but um, we were talking about systemic uh, racism. And, you know, I was asking for, you know, what do you mean by systemic racism? Like, what is that? And her main point was that, you know, we had, we used to have slavery and Jim Crow laws and that kind of thing. And, you know, black people were discriminated against with housing and, and all of that kind of stuff. And basically that's trickled down to today's generation through financial means. It was like black people were discriminated against in the past. So they tend to have less money now. And therefore they're worse off. And so, and, and, and it was like the point being made was that this is because of money. Like discrimination in the past causes black people to be poorer on average today than white people. And they're worse off because they're poorer on average. So then the question is, well, now that we don't have those discriminatory policies anymore, it's really about money then, isn't it? Like, you know, it's, it's more about, about socioeconomic status than about race, right? I mean, if you're, if you're saying that past racist policies caused a difference in, uh, in financial class and financial class is what's causing disparities today, then like the, the most immediate cause here that needs to be addressed is the financial cause, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, so once you fix the race, that's a problem. They say systemic racism. The root word of systemic is system. It's saying the system is racist. That's not the same as saying the system was racist. When you say Jim Crow laws and slavery and housing, unfair housing practices equals systemic racism today. None of that is the case today. So the system is not racist. There's no, there is no evidence that the system is racist. Even if the system disproportionately affects one group or another, it's not racist unless the intention is to hurt one group more than another. And there's no evidence for that at all. And statistics, like you say, it's a socioeconomic thing because the prospects for poor whites are not any better than the prospects for poor blacks. It's the being poor thing. That's the problem. Yeah. Like intergener, like multi-generational poverty is a problem for everyone who's in poverty. And you know what? Fun fact, there are far more poor white people than there are poor black people. Now the the percentage is lower, but what the fuck does the percentage matter if you're a poor white person? Do you feel privileged because a bunch of your cousins aren't poor? Does that make you feel better about yourself because people that look like you are doing better? Who cares? You're poor. <laughs> like you're poor. Your children are probably going to be poor and their children are probably going to be poor. That is a problem with all poor folks. So I'm not saying it isn't something that we need to think about and address this difference in percentage, you know, the likeliness of being poor, depending on, you know, what color you are. 
But the point is if there's a way forward, if there's a way, if there's a way to fix it, it is not by diving deeper into identity politics and thinking more and more every day about how different we are. If that's all like, you know, and I, I think Sam Harris says it best, you know, he's like, he articulates better than anyone I've heard before the argument against identity politics, but, you know, basically saying that whatever has happened in the past, there is no way that the, the way to fix it is by focusing more on our differences instead of less. If obsessing over what makes us all different and what's obsessing about race and gender and you know identity is not going to get us to this post-racial harmonious future. How could it possibly? Unless the goal is just white genocide. And once there's no more white people, I guess, you know, everybody can be happy. But uh, I don't think that'll happen either because then they'll just find a way to, you know, bicker with each other about who has it worse, right? Yeah. Someone's always going to be worse off than someone else. So the oppression Olympics will continue, even in this post-white people world. But, you know, but yeah, he, he said it. He said it, and it's absolutely statistically true that the prospects for poor white people is, is no better or are no better than the prospects for poor black people or poor Hispanics or poor Asians. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to recommend Coleman Hughes. Uh, it is a, is a great guy to listen to on this topic. Um, he was just on, he was on Sam Harris's podcast not too long ago. He's the undergrad from, uh, I can't remember what, what school it is now. He's an undergrad at, uh, God damn it. I'm drawing a blank on the school. Can you look up can you Google Coleman? UCLA? Yeah. UCLA. That's the one. Yeah. I remember that guy. Yeah. So yeah, he's got a lot of, of interesting thoughts on the topic of race and, uh, you know, race. Yeah. Enough. Just to back up the crap I was saying before that the uh, U.S. Census Bureau in 2017, not even a year ago, released the uh, U.S. poverty statistics. And according to this, uh, the poverty rate for white non-Hispanics is 8.8%. And the poverty rate for black doesn't say non-Hispanics for black people is 22%. So that is, you know, significantly more than double, almost triple, eh, a little more than double the poverty rate. However, there are 17.3 million white Americans in poverty and 9.2 million black Americans in poverty. So that's again, almost double, not quite double, but that's a butt ton more. There are way more poor white people than there are poor black people. So this is, this is what I'm talking about. Like, this is why I don't get the obsession with the percentages. I mean, it's important, but if you're poor and you're white, what do you care? <laughs> like, what do you care if 91.2% of people who look like you are not poor? Like, how is that comforting? What advantage does that give you? None whatsoever, right? So in fact, like if you were going to go and talk about people's life experiences and you took any random group of people and you like, if you're not talking about what's the percentage chance that a black person will have a sad story or that a white person will have a sad story, if you just, if you went out there looking for stories, you would get so many more horrible stories about growing up poor from white people than, than anyone else even though it's the lowest percentage. Anyway, whatever. I'll let those stats speak for themselves. That's it for today's show. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. So if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button below. 
Uh, if you're listening on any of our other audio platforms, uh, please make sure you subscribe, leave ratings or comments. It really helps algorithmically in getting getting the word out about our show. Um, if you like the show, please share it with your friends on social media. Please like the Philosophication with Ginger and the Beard Facebook page. And please make sure you comment down below. We really want to engage you guys in free and open conversation. That's really the whole point of doing this. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.